Okay, it's a great pleasure to be here, by the way, and thanks for all of you for turning out. Uh, I don't want to rain on our parade, but I do want to begin with a caution about connecting Shakespeare with contemporary American politics. It's very tempting. Uh, here are these great plays. They embody great wisdom. We'd like to apply them immediately uh, to our lives. I'll just say we have to bear in mind that Shakespeare was writing before the concept of representative government was even developed. It was through Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, and the American founding fathers, who developed our notion of representative democracy. Uh, so Shakespeare would have been somewhat puzzled by our form of government as we are sometimes ourselves. Uh, he only knew direct democracy, the kind that Athens had, and so we have to be careful about simply applying lessons uh, from his plays to our day. What it does show, however, and the fundamental point I want to make, is that Shakespeare was very aware of the phenomenon of forms of government, that they do differ. Uh, he would have known of democracy, aristocracy, monarchy, uh, and he realized that human life is very different under these different forms of government. Uh, and that's in some ways the broadest lesson uh, that we can take from Shakespeare for understanding our government. Uh, now, uh, when I first started studying Shakespeare way back in the 1960s, uh, it was almost universally assumed that Shakespeare was simply an uncritical supporter of monarchy. Uh, I'll make the point that uh, living under a monarchy, uh, and in some ways a rather oppressive one, there was no way that Shakespeare was going to uh, make public any kind of open criticism of monarchy. Uh, and indeed, the way uh, Shakespeare scholars presented Shakespeare uh, back in the middle of the 20th century, uh, you would think that the Elizabethan monarchy was the stablest form of government uh, ever, and England was going to be a monarchy forever because no one challenged it. Uh, now, I will point out that uh, a little more than three decades after Shakespeare's death, uh, England became a republic. Uh, under Oliver Cromwell. They actually beheaded Charles I. Uh, so there was some thoughts about republic in Shakespeare's day and some questioning of monarchy. Uh, and there's a good book by a man named Andrew Hatfield called Shakespeare's, Shakespeare and Republicanism that began the challenge that I participate in. Uh, that uh, the thing about Shakespeare is that uh, he questioned all forms of government, just as he questioned all forms of human life. Uh, he could always see the good and the bad things uh, about any human being, and I feel the same way about forms of government. So for example, he did live under a monarchy uh, and wanted to live under the best monarchy possible. He examines monarchy in many of his plays, most famously in his history plays, which deal with the uh, a whole series of uh, uh, English monarchs from Richard II to Henry VII. Uh, and Shakespeare does admire a monarch who knows what he's doing. Uh, and he shows how a single person can provide effective leadership, especially in wartime, but again, if he knows what he's doing. The problem is, with monarchy, uh, you don't always get to choose the best person for the job. Uh, and especially in the English form of monarchy, which was inherited monarchy. And indeed, as Shakespeare shows in his history plays, the biggest problem with monarchy is succession. Uh, you can have uh, the best king possible, which I believe Shakespeare tried to portray in Henry V, but he died young and was succeeded by Henry VI, who was about as incompetent uh, as he could be as a king uh, because he was a child when he came to the throne. And, and suffer under the regency of some nasty people. Uh, and that is the basic problem for monarchy, even if you ever succeed in getting a good king. Uh, his successor may not be so good. And to amplify the problem, Shakespeare shows that being born to kingship uh, can have deleterious effects on your character. Uh, it means you're subject to flattery. Uh, it means you become too complacent. Uh, 
Shakespeare was actually, it seems, very worried about people who were born to kingship. Uh, he likes people who had to struggle to become king, as happened, say, with Henry the Fourth. It's almost as if Shakespeare thinks the usurpers going to be more qualified because he's had to fight to get to the crown. But if someone who just inherits it, <coughs> we have the expression "born with a silver tool, spoon in your mouth," and that's the problem for a number of Shakespeare's kings. It's actually one of the most disturbing aspects of his understanding of politics that the very uh, process of becoming king, uh, growing up fit for power, uh, may make you bad as a king. Uh, so Shakespeare didn't think kingship was the ideal solution uh, to the human problem. And he was unusually interested in Republican forms of government. Uh, that's with a small r, I hasten to point out. Uh, uh, so that, for example, he wrote two plays set in Venice, uh, which was the most important republic in his day, and specifically a commercial republic, which Shakespeare was fascinated by. And he was very interested in the Roman Republic. Uh, and his Roman plays uh, deal with the whole issue of how the Roman Republic was founded and then how it eventually decayed and was corrupted uh, into an uh, empire. What Shakespeare liked about republics is it produced uh, great leaders, especially military leaders, and military leaders were more important in Shakespeare's day uh, than they are in our world, uh, and in fact, uh, in some ways, the crucial function of the, the monarch or other leaders was to uh, preserve England, to preserve the uh, independence of the country. Uh, and so Shakespeare was impressed uh, at the process of republics, which seemed to be a good way of choosing rulers. For example, in the Roman Republic, uh, it was ruled uh, uh, by two consuls, they were called. Uh, uh, and this meant uh, that they served as a check on each other. They had to agree, uh, especially on military policy, uh, together. And moreover, a consul can serve only for one year and could not succeed himself. Uh, and so this gave a lot of people opportunities to achieve the highest executive uh, role uh, in the Roman Republic. <coughs> and that encouraged people to go into politics and produced a kind of competitive rivalry uh, that made them uh, uh, good rulers. So, uh, in some ways, it, it seems Shakespeare thought the Republic uh, was uh, the best solution uh, for getting talented people into politics. Uh, on the other hand, Republican politics uh, was exceedingly turbulent with all this turnover uh, and all these ambitious people competing. It eventually led to the civil wars in Rome that uh, uh, undermined the Republic and led to the uh, Roman Empire. Uh, so, uh, in some ways, Shakespeare hoped, uh, I think, to combine uh, the virtues of these different regimes. Uh, there was, in antiquity, and again, uh, revived in the Renaissance, the idea of what was called the mixed regime, uh, which uh, was neither simply republic, uh, aristocracy, or monarchy, but combined the elements. That was what was famous about the Roman Republic. Uh, in its day, uh, it had the, these consuls were like a king, except there were two of them. The Senate was the aristocratic element in the regime, and uh, uh, the people with their tribunes were the democratic element. And in the ancient world, people were already theorizing this as the solution to the political problem. And in the Renaissance, in Shakespeare's day, Machiavelli had offered a similar argument. Now, very quickly, and I'm almost done, uh, the, uh, uh, I think Shakespeare's hope was that the uh, British monarchy could be remodeled on the pattern of the ancient mixed regime. With a monarchy, of course, but uh, parliament being the, uh, the House of Lords being the aristocratic element, House of Commons being the democratic element. And I think uh, Henry V is intended to show the English monarch that they need to yield some power to the aristocrats, some power to the people. Now, that's a very quick sketch of what I think Shakespeare's politics uh, was. But just to note its relevance, uh, I think Shakespeare's concern with the different forms of government, what their advantages and disadvantages are, that's something uh, we can learn from. And in general, I think Shakespeare's view 
was that government needs to be limited. That what he liked about the Roman Republic was what we would call checks and balances and limited powers. And of course, thinking about the Roman Republic <coughs> went very much into the Federalist Papers and the uh, 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 our, our American Constitution. Uh, to me, I'll just single out one moment in Shakespeare's plays that tells us uh, maybe the most. Uh, in Henry IV, part two, Henry IV is coming to the throne. Henry, uh, Henry IV has died, and his son uh, is coming to the throne as Henry V. And in his childhood, uh, uh, his youth, uh, he got into an argument with the Lord Chief Justice, and uh, the Lord Chief Justice put him in jail. Uh, and everyone's expecting that the Lord Chief Justice is going to lose his head, which uh, Henry V comes to the throne, and no. He says, what you did was right. You're my father now. I'll take your leadership. And I think that's a, a, a marvelous moment in Shakespeare to show that he hoped that justice could prevail and that monarchs could put aside their, their feelings and go by uh, what was truly just. And those ideas in the broadest sense, uh, that power has to be limited uh, and, and uh, placed in a regime the various checks and balances. That's the lesson I would mostly draw from Shakespeare for our day. Some of the uh, relevant uh, relevancies are uh, obvious, but I won't go into any more detail. I'll, I'll stop here. Hey, uh, first of all, can everyone hear me all right? Is that OK? Is that, that good? All right. I guess you wouldn't, if you're not, you're not going to not, because then you can't hear me. Um, uh, thank you all so much for, for, for coming. My name is uh, Isaac Butler. As John Paul said, I'm a uh, theater director and critic, and I hosted a podcast called Lend Me Your Ears, which if I can just briefly self-promote, you can find at slate.com slash Shakespeare. Um, and uh, it was a podcast about Shakespeare and politics using six of uh, Shakespeare's plays. And so um, I'm kind of a lay enthusiast on this panel of of learned and, and eminent scholars, which, which I have to say makes me feel just a little bit like how I imagine the monkeys felt when they opened for Jimi Hendrix, which was a real thing that happened. Um, so we're here to talk about Shakespeare and politics today, but I actually find that very difficult to do in concrete terms. Maybe it's because I'm a wishy-washy artist, I, I, I don't know. But So I'd rather talk a little bit about how I read Shakespeare and how that has led me to read Shakespeare's uh, politics. Because I find as much as I might like not, uh, as much as I might want to, I can't escape thinking like a theater maker. I've been working professionally in the theater since I was 12, and it is on some level who I am. Because of that, when I look at a Shakespeare play, I am basically never looking at it as a work of literature, but as a work of drama, which is to say it is a work that creates its meaning not through language, but through dramatic action, of which language is a part. When a character speaks, I wonder, what is this character doing with this speech act? When I've read a scene, I wonder, what is this scene doing, or this act doing, or this play doing? Not saying, but doing. And while I look at speeches in individual moments, and believe me, I love a granular deep dive into the meaning of a specific word as much as the next person here, uh, I'm always trying to think about them in the broader context of the play itself and its journey. Now, I'm just gonna say right now, there are two enormous problems with this approach. And so perhaps admitting to them makes me a poor spokesman for my methodology, but what the heck, I might as well be honest. The first is that theater works through dramatic action and language is a part of dramatic action. But you may have noticed when you read a play that plays, particularly the plays of Shakespeare, are not action, they're just language. The very thing I said is inadequate on its own to creating and determining meaning. So we must use language as our guide for finding the action because the action itself is not on the page. As Hamlet reminds us over and over again, action must be acted by actors. The second problem, and this one is a real doozy, is that there is no working definition for the term dramatic action. Now, I know that's weird, right? I wish that I could tell you that I'm gonna define it for you right now, but I'm absolutely not going to do that. Aristotle was unable to do it. There have been debates and symposia and panels on what the term means for hundreds of years. Uh, you can look up the great American theater critic, Eric Bentley, 
wrote this essay on dramatic action, and if you read it, you can actually watch his brain melt out of his ears in real time as he tries to figure it out. And I would like to survive this panel to get home to my wife and child with my brain intact, so I'm not going to do it. But uh, the reason why I suspect this is, and there's a wonderful book by Francis Ferguson called The Idea of a Theater in which he talks about this, is that dramatic action cannot be abstractly defined. It is an analogic concept. Specific actions can be named, and the action of a play can be described, but the term is very difficult to nail down outside of its individual context. To explain by example, one thing you see often in Shakespeare is that the action of his plays proceeds by analogy. The same situation develops in many different forms which all reflect and reflect, refract off each other. Hamlet's loss of his father in pursuit of justice is mirrored in the player king's speech, and it's mirrored again in Laertes after Hamlet kills Polonius. Usurpation in the Tempest plays out against the king, uh, against Prospero by his brother Antonio, against Caliban by Prospero, against the King Alonso by Antonio and Sebastian, and in a parody of all of these, against Prospero by Caliban and Trinculo and Stefano. Even a relatively subplot-free play like Richard II has its analogies in the gardener scene with his extended vegetal metaphors, and in the end of the play, in which Henry secures his place on the throne with the exact same legitimacy-destroying means by which Richard lost it. And proceeding via analogy isn't self-contained either. Shakespeare's career was not that long, and he wrote many plays during it quite quickly. And so you see the same idea and the same dramatic situation crop up again and again across the plays. So the plays across the canon become analogous for one another as well. And Shakespeare, in some ways here, I think is mirroring his beloved Montaigne by assaying these subjects from as many angles as possible, and coming at times, especially in the great tragedies, to unstable and impossible to nail down results. Shakespeare develops his themes oppositionally. His plays contain truth, and sometimes they even contain fixed meanings, but these meanings and truths are revealed dialectically. If you're looking for a comforting, straightforward approach to life and its myriad problems, Shakespeare is not actually the playwright for you, as much as our greeting card industry might wish otherwise. Another key aspect of the theater maker approach is a kind of triangul triangulation that occurs when you look at a play that isn't contemporary. All plays take place in three contexts. There's the era and context internal to the play itself, there's the era and context in which the play was written, and there is the era and context in which the audience watches the play <laughs> being performed, or often reads the play, which is to say our era and our context. It was this triangulation that was most important for me in making Lend Me Your Ears. That podcast actually, to be completely honest with all of you, uh, grew out of a massive failure on my part. I was teaching Shakespeare, uh, and uh, I was supposed to be teaching Shakespeare the day after Donald Trump was elected president of the United States. And it was for me and for my students a kind of traumatic event. Might not have been for you, but it was for me. And we thought the world was headed in one direction, and it instead was headed in another drastically different one that we probably should have come seen coming. Which, by the way, is the kind of thing Shakespeare writes about a lot. And yet, on that day, as I tried to talk to my students, I couldn't give them anything from Shakespeare. I had no wisdom, no questions, no great ideas of what to say. And I realized in that moment, this was years ago, that the reason why I couldn't really relate Shakespeare into that moment was not because I didn't understand our context, it's because I didn't understand his, and I didn't understand the political tides that were buffeting him while he wrote. In part, this is because direct commentary on politics was essentially illegal in Shakespeare's theater, and all of his plays had to make it through an official regime of censorship. But it was also because I had been reared as a reader in a kind of new criticism, close reading, the author's not exactly dead, but maybe they're on life support in the next room, you're having a hushed conversation with their family kind of style. Uh, in which we only paid attention to the text, which was extremely useful, but left out a bunch of other things. Because those matters external to the text were absolutely vital for figuring out what the text was doing, particularly if we want to control for our own biases and assumptions. To truly confront Shakespeare, I needed to know what he himself was likely confronting be it the succession crisis that so clearly fuels many of his plays in the 1590s, or England's encounters with the Muslim world that may have helped shape Othello. And when I put all this together, I found the plays to be, if anything, actually more bewilderingly complex and contradictory than I had thought. And I often found political ideas that were extremely troubling and challenging. 
particularly because Shakespeare is writing prior to the Enlightenment. And so in our time, the plays often appear to critique the very Enlightenment values that we often take for granted. If you're someone who believes in representative democracy and the power of reason, for example, you can't help but be a little bit troubled by Julius Caesar. And if you want to sleep well at night secure in the belief that you understand yourself or your loved ones, it's probably best to leave that copy of Othello unopened on your nightstand. I also discovered how seldom any moment in Shakespeare play really was self-contained. Uh, a really clear example to me is the St. Crispin's Day speech, right? We all, we all love that speech. It's stirring. We've seen Kenneth Branagh do it. We've seen Lawrence Olivier do it. You know, we, uh, it's, it's this great piece of inspirational rhetoric. But if you follow the action of the Henriad, uh, you see that in Henry IV, Part One, Hal learns uh, how to use language and the performance of honor to his own ends. And you learn in, Hen and in Henry, the sec uh, Henry IV, Part Two, he's told explicitly by his father to secure his rule by ginning up a foreign war, which is what the story of Henry V, if you want to look at it some ways, is about. And that casts that speech in a very different light. It is a masterful piece of leadership. But we also have to wonder to, to, to what ends. Um, and I also saw something else in his plays, which is that there are major shifts that happen in the way his plays talk and think about some ideas. There's a real rising disgust in his plays, a physical revulsion at sex, for example, which has led to many scholarly theories about whether or not he had syphilis, uh, which is not what this panel is about. Uh, but, and I think you can also see some shift in how he imagines the role of the people in the government between Julius Caesar and Coriolanus, for example. But there's other subjects on which his plays are remarkably consistent. And I'd like to mention one of them, because I think it's very relevant to us today, which is that there is a deep skepticism in his plays about the efficacy and virtue of violence. In Julius Caesar, resorting to political violence permanently destroys the very republic that the conspirators are trying to preserve. Henry IV contains the, perhaps the greatest puncturing of the balloon of honor ever in the speech that Falstaff gives before the Battle of Shrewsbury. There's a little justice to be found in the bloodshed at the end of Hamlet. Violence is a form of failure, uh, or it is a force cynically used by those that hunger for power to secure their status. And I mention that because today it is Wednesday, January 22nd, 2020. I am 40 years old, and we have been at war since six months after I left college. This war is one we now know the Pentagon itself thought was unwinnable and counterproductive as early as 2005, and yet we are still fighting it. Lest we forget, less than a month ago, it looked like we were going to expand that war into Iran for reasons that made little sense and were likely based on falsehoods. This is the kind of cynical, cyclical failure that Shakespeare imagined again and again in his plays, but he struggled mightily to imagine a way to make it stop. In his later plays, the romances, we see forgiveness enter into the dramatic action. But forgiveness in Shakespeare's plays is ununderstandable. It is a form of magic. It is a miracle that can neither be controlled nor understood. A wife forgiving her husband and a statue coming to life are as miraculous. And the dead child she must forgive him for can never be resurrected. Prospero for, can forgive, but the act leaves him despairing and thinking every third thought on his grave. It seems there were limits then to even Shakespeare's imagination. But by entering into and working through the social problems he dramatized, perhaps we can imagine something different. Or at least through his contradictions, we can understand ourselves and our own contradictions a little bit better. Thank you. Thank you to, um, to Jordan, Jean Paul, Stephen, um, the Center for Liberal Education, the Bryan Center, of course, um, my colleagues, and to everybody for coming at the end of what must be a long day. Nearly at the end of what must be a long week. Um, I, um, I want to break the fourth wall a little bit and take a poll. <laughs> um, so I, I'm curious about where most of us have first encountered Shakespeare in a sustained way. And by sustained way, I just mean like an entire play. So for how many of you, just quick show of hands, was it um, going to a performance, either a film or a play? Couple. For how many of you was it um, reading? At, I mean, let me, um, let me distinguish this. For how many of you was it reading on your own, like at home or in the library, you're just like, oh, uh, this dude looks pretty cool. I think I'll be my bad. <laughs> that was me. I was a total dork. Yeah. I didn't know about stage direction, so I was, I was like, aside. 
Um, for how many of you, um, I'm actually going to do that later. Um, for, for how many of you was it reading in a classroom? All right, not unexpected. Um, so I, I asked this partly um, to, um, to come back to it, but so we have kind of three frames or situations for these initial encounters with Shakespeare. And we might think of them as, and um, I have kind of three related but not entirely um, mapped onto a frame. One is Shakespeare in scholarship, one is Shakespeare in the classroom, and then one is Shakespeare in the world, or we might even think of it as Shakespeare in the wild, as it does more. And within this, um, within these frames, there's at least two ways to approach um, Jordan's query about what Shakespeare has to teach us about politics today. Um, so one focuses, um, to go back to um, Paul Cantor's initial remarks, focuses on um, uh, trying to map connections between especially the plays and um, political figures or situations. Or, um, I reread an op-ed by Stephen Greenblatt after the 2016 election, um, likening him to Richard III. So another focuses more on their performance. Um, and even these two categories kind of immediately split into several subcategories concerning the politics of authorship, the politics of audience. So, um, and by this I mean who, um, partly who has access to different modes of um, transferring the plays. Um, so access to different kinds of text and performances. So it's not cheap to go to the theater in the US today. Um, even if you go to a student performance, you might be able to take time off from your two jobs and still wait and stand by for an hour. But um, the theater is, is, a, is a pretty, um, demographically limited space for most of us. Um, so this explosion of possibility paradoxically suggests, again, a larger approach on that concerns what I'm calling a politics of presence that is necessarily bound to both access and to action. So in um, these brief remarks, I want to suggest that those of us um, that are involved in scholarship and teaching um, need to take our cues, haha, from those who are staging, performing, and transforming Shakespeare in the world. And so by politics of presence, and I should say, um, I wrote this and then um, Googled the phrase and was like, oh damn, someone wrote this book already. So I cite her without remembering her name and um, we can all Google it and remember her name. Um, by politics of presence, I mean not only, um, or even primarily what my colleague um, Hugh Grady at, um, um, what Hugh Grady and others have called presentism, in Shakespeare studies, and this was partly um, a phrase that they coined um, to counter the then prevalent mode of historicism in Shakespeare studies, which was all about kind of trying to uncover the historical context in which the plays have been written. So I don't mean just presentism, um, but I mean that Shakespeare demands presence from audiences today more than ever, and that presence in itself constitutes a political foundation for action. And here I'm thinking in part of um, Hunter Arendt. So here, presence in the world also means love of the world. Again, I'm kind of toggling um, back to Arendt here and her phrase Amor Mundi, um, where love um, translates Paul's chorus for um, Jerome and Augustine's caritas rather than John's agape. And I think there's a whole other paragraph that I've chopped out here that we could say about various types of love. So um, one short answer to what does um, Shakespeare teach us about politics today is that um, is, I think, um, is love of the world and love of one another in the world. Um, so senses of present in, um, again, the, a politics of presence. So one is temporal and spatial. Um, present means here and now. Um, it means, as I've already suggested, presentism, which is a scholarly um, term um, that focuses more on the here and now. Um, it mean, present also means a gift perhaps most especially the true gift of grace, um, as Isaac was just discussing, especially in the romances. Um, it also has a second temporal sense that we can um, access by um, breaking into the word a little bit, pre-sent. So it has um, both um, a past and a future, something I'll come back to. So um, presence, um, weirdly, um, also makes us think about the uses of history, the demands of translation and interpretation. I want to pause for a moment um, and think about public and private presence. And this might seem a little bit odd, because usually when we're thinking about politics or the political, it's automatically public. Um, 
But remember, um, the personal is always political, a lesson um, that feminists and queer theorists and race theorists and um, activists have taught us again and again. So in this way, a politics of presence necessarily begins not, um, not you know, always in the voting booth, although it can begin there, but it begins with you and me, um, each of us, wherever we most thoughtfully encounter ourselves and our ideas in conjunction with others. It begins with each of us um, expressing an openness and a willingness to encounter and to be encountered, to witness, often without judging. And of course, um, in certain cases, immediate judgment and action are absolutely necessary, um, perhaps today more than ever, as we witness anti-Semitic attacks, anti-Islamic attacks, um, cops shooting black men in the street. So um, I, I say that kind of warily and with um, a lot of brackets. Um, at the beginning, I spoke about taking our cues um, from, um, essentially from performers and directors, um, those who are, and um, I want to kind of go back to that um, for a moment and think about not just presence, but um, the process of becoming present. Um, and I say we, take, we need to take our cues from performance partly because performance is always an example of um, a present that is um, fleeting. <laughs> you know, every performance is there and then gone. Um, so you can say the same thing about a reading, but you can always reread. So, um, and I um, also think we have to take a lesson here from um, the history of, um, of how um, performance would have been in 16th and 17th century London, which is that um, if you go, how many of you have been to a Shakespeare play especially? Okay. Um, how noisy was the audience? Was everybody sitting here kind of like this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it tends to be, you know, you're, you're sitting there, you're at the Kimmel Center or wherever, and you're, I think you can talk like this at certain moments. So this is not the way um, most people would initially have experienced theater. It would be much more interactive. It would be much more like a Rocky Horror show or now apparently Cats, the movie. Um, so that kind of interactivity, um, it, um, so not just action, but interaction um, in performance history um, kind of weirdly brings us also closer to thinking about how readers interact with texts. So um, most of us, um, like old school people like me, I write notes in my margin, but um, my students are doing all kinds of cool things with tablets and um, stuff like that. So we interact with our texts in different ways, and this kind of interactivity of performance translates into an interactivity of reading that is not the same, but that models how we have to treat Shakespeare in the world. We, we need it to be interactive. So this note in performance history, um, perhaps best figuring, weirdly, reading practices at this moment, um, brings me to the central paradox of the politics of presence. And it's the paradox of Aristotle's novel, or um, of Augustine's um, notion of time. Um, that is, that becoming present is always also a becoming past and a becoming future. So facets of present necessary of necessity include history and potentiality or futurity. And the question, what does Shakespeare have to teach us about politics today, can't really be considered, um, um, as each of us have kind of um, talked about without considering both past and future. So um, instead of a side, I will, I will note here transition, because I did not make a transition, so transition. Um, perhaps, um, and I said this perhaps, and, and now, I, now I say no, um, to help with the perhaps. The most pressing issue for scholars of early periods, and I say scholars of early periods very consciously, but um, I'm also gonna broaden it and say one of the most pressing issues for us in this country today at this moment is the need to confront those misrepresenting the past in the service of racist nationalisms and white supremacism. For example, the Nazis in Charlottesville and the New Zealand terrorists who bombed a mosque sporting medieval symbols, much as the Nazi party itself appropriated the ancient symbol of the swastika. Those of us who teach and write about early periods need to fight this myth of a homogenous white western past in every way that we can. And I use fight very deliberately here because, of course, um, most of us, again, were encountering Shakespeare in the classroom. Like, oh, what am I going to go, like, beat somebody over the head with a copy of Henry V? <laughs> um, but, again, the lesson here is in how to think um, as well as how to act in the world. So it means countering 
correcting, sometimes, sometimes censoring. It means rendering ourselves visible and vulnerable, perhaps more visible and vulnerable than we already are. It means advocating for students and scholars of color and amplifying their voices, citing their work and making our institutions safe for them. And a true politics of presence means not limiting these practices to the classroom or to our professional or um, um, scholarly lives. So this is how access and action figure together. So then the question um, that we students often ask, and maybe, maybe that some of you have asked, is uh, like, Shakespeare's like the ultimate dead European white guy. Um, what's he going to tell us about how to um, engage in this kind of um, present um, politics that pays attention to race and pays attention to gender? And um, nobody, I don't think anybody can argue now that she, you can have an unqueer Shakespeare. So like, that, that good. Um, but how do, how do we deal with uh, as, um, race and gender, especially in these plays that um, to some seem very um, unprogressive? So in some ways, I think we have to look at um, earlier but ongoing fights for representation. So there were certainly people who were interested in thinking and writing and reading about and acting and directing Shakespeare with a mind to recognizing and presenting and perhaps intervening in political movements and political moments. And this is again why the triple temporal faces of presence matters. Um, well, well, we can learn about um, social constructions of race, gender, sexuality in England in the early 17th century, and that will and that. Um, um, that uh, those lessons will help us to undo the myths of monolithic whiteness or of heteronormativity. It's only by taking these estrangements with us into the world and continuing to question and often work to dismantle the inequalities that persist. Um, so while learning about the global renaissance or medieval gay marriage or the queer politics of Shakespeare's theater, Shakespeare's theater is if that itself or monolithic, are crucial, um, staying present and connecting this scholarship and what we learn about these historical constructions of race, for example, with what's happening in the world every day is the next step. And so this is why I asked um, at the beginning, like, where did you encounter Shakespeare? So, um, and all of those places are, are, are pretty closed, right? Um, the, the library or your bedroom where you're reading or the theater, especially, you know, um, expensive American theater where you're sitting there very politely, or um, in the confines of the classroom. I'm saying we need more Shakespeare in the world. And Shakespeare in the world, and um, yeah, that's what I. So it's not just um, what Shakespeare can teach us about politics today, but I think how we um, how we learn um, and take it forward. That's right. Thank you. I'd like to hear your responses to one another uh, before we move on to subsequent questions, because a lot of what I wanted to talk about is already come up. Questions about public, questions about government, questions about. Uh, <laughs> Can I bring this together? Yeah. Um, to, I, I really loved um, um, oh. Professor. Thank you. <laughs> I generally still think I'm like, oh. um, I want to show respect, but not um, but not um, render us all like children. Um, so. Paul, well, um, I loved what you said about um, that Shakespeare is always questioning forms of government and um, shows how different forms of life um, um, are lived um, under different forms of government. And I really loved what um, you said, of course, about Montaigne and his saying. So questioning and a saying have something in common. So do either of you or both of you want to bring this notion of questioning or a saying um, well, I mean, I could just say a brief thing about about Montaigne. You know, mm -hmm. the the because I think Montaigne's influence on Montaigne and Plutarch. I just keep coming back to so if this accidentally turns to a comment on Plutarch. I apologize profusely. Um, but the uh, the but you know you see a lot of influence of both of those texts. With Plutarch, it has a lot to what what Paul brought up, which I think is really brilliant about the how the human being changes under different institutions, even though those institutions are formed and led by human beings, and that relationship. And from Montaigne, who, if you've ever read about the process of how his, he composed his essays, it's totally bizarre. He would revisit them months later and then just write new ideas in them without taking out the old ideas, so they contradict each other all the time. I mean, the, the, you know, the modern essay was actually created through this very strange process that we do not mimic today. But this idea that everything's kind of unstable, uh, Philip Lopate talks about it like the hawk 
swooping down on prey. The thing you're saying is the prey. And the hawk is swooping down on it from all of these different angles and often just kind of slightly missing it, actually. And I think you see that all over Shakespeare once he starts reading Montaigne, that lots of stuff becomes more unstable. Lots of ideas start conflicting with each other and starts holding them in the plays at the same time, which is what I think makes them very thorny if you want to try to be like, the political program of this play is we should do X. Almost never works out because he's always saying, well, I'm going to show you the person doing X, which I might even sympathize with, but I'm going to show you how it all goes to hell anyway. You know? Um, and so that, that for me is where I see these two ideas, I, I see these two ideas meeting. That saying is a form of questioning. Um, even if it doesn't have question marks in it. It's a form of questioning because I'm going to bring up one statement and I'm going to bring up the opposed statement and I'm giving them equal weight to see what happens when they bounce off each other. Yes, I do think Shakespeare's fundamental activity is questioning. He questioned everything. Uh, he questioned the world he lived in. He questioned worlds from the past, like ancient Rome. Uh, it's how he became the great dramatist he is. He's one of the few dramatists who questions everything. Uh, and I'll just add to that that uh, you should let Shakespeare question you. I'll just say if you, if you come to Shakespeare and just find your ideas in Shakespeare, uh, you're missing something. And you're missing a big opportunity because he was a profoundly wise person uh, and uh, we can learn from his questioning. And I'll just say, <laughs> challenge one thing that you said. I think Shakespeare actually admired war. He admired war heirs and great generals. He knew they could do terrible things. Henry V orders the execution of prisoners men who'd surrender, and it was his obligation to protect them, and yet he, he orders their, their murder when it's the only thing he can do to get himself and all the soldiers alive at the Battle of Agincourt. It's a terrible moment, and I think Shakespeare understood it. He even has Henry lie about it, as if he were provoked by the French to do it, and I think that shows a form of hypocrisy, but it also shows that uh, Shakespeare understands Henry mustn't be proud of this. It's one of those nasty things you sometimes have to do in politics, but keep it as quiet uh, as you could. So there, there are so many signs in Shakespeare of how wars can go badly, uh, even for the people who are victors in it. But if you just look at the characters he wrote about, so often they are great generals, uh, Macbeth, Othello, Mark Antony, Coriolanus, Julius Caesar. Uh, he seemed to have been particularly fascinated by that. Now, he treats these figures as tragic, uh, but that means they're great, and somehow their greatness is tinged with doing things uh, that are evil uh, and destructive. So uh, I, I, I really, you know, it's very easy today to reject the war. It's become nastier. It's become a matter of technology become more and more inhuman when we're killing people with drones now, and it isn't even the kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat that Shakespeare admired. I think he did have a very different attitude towards war uh, than many of us do today, and uh, he may be wrong, uh, but maybe we should take a look at why he admired uh, generals. For one thing, I, would, uh, I think Shakespeare politics was so important to Shakespeare because he believed that some aspects of human nature will manifest themselves in politics in ways that they don't otherwise. I'm in Philadelphia, and I'm in Villanova. We're a basketball town, right? So let me use a basketball analogy. Uh, I love the phrase money player. Shakespeare was interested in money players. You can shoot all the great baskets you like alone on the court in practice. But it becomes something else when someone's guarding you. And ultimately, you want to talk about seventh game in the NBA Finals, your team's behind by one point, you get fouled, you go to the line. Uh, and you better sink those two baskets. And that'll tell you who a great player is. And Shakespeare felt that way about politicians and about generals, that they were tested in ways where everything's on the line. And you only find out something about someone's courage, determination when everything is on the line. I think Shakespearean tragedies are the seventh game 
the NBA Finals when you find out who's got the right stuff. Uh, and I think Shakespeare thought, thought that there are only some human situations that test people to the core. And I think war was one of them for him. I think that is true, but I also, and I, and I, um, I take the point about um, generals and um, especially generals becoming political figures, but I mean, then I think of Titus Andronicus, who is a general who's come. And, um, you know, one of the things that Shakespeare could teach us about politics today is don't end up in Titus. Like, don't end up in any of the tragedies, but especially in Titus. And, like, if we look at. They really don't. Like, <laughs> like, if we look at this, um, and especially, um, I'm interested in what both of you have to say about if we, if we put. Titus and Coriolanus both on the table as, you know, the earliest Roman play and the last Roman play. And Titus is this, how many people have read Titus or seen it? Okay, so it's this wacky play where it's, I'm like, and um, Polly will correct me on this, but I would say it's like, it's like half, half empire, but it's an elective empire. Um, so it's half republic, half empire. There's a tribune, as there are in the republic, but they're, they're, they're voting for the, for the um, for the emperor, it's very very weird. So it's this um, it's this it, 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 as all of um, Shakespeare's poems are. It's a world that never existed really. But this is even more kind of wacky. This is like HBO as opposed to like PBS. Or so um, and then in Coriolanus we have this very um, much more faithful to classical sources, um, to Plutarch, um, to to um, Cicero, to Livy um, vision of a soldier in the Republic and the problems of um, what might happen when a council, um, the, 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 the drama in that play, that um, the election of the council turns into a charge of treason. So um, like if we take these two realms and put them on the table and think about that problem of testing um, human character, um, perhaps under different ways, is that something? That is of interest to speak to, or you, you grabbed that across, but it sounds like you have a... No, I just wanted to, I'm sure I was going to, I was just prepping, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, I mean, first of all, you mentioned Plutarch, thank you, two points. Uh, but the, uh, the, the, uh, two, two points, is that basketball? I only, I only know tennis, so I'll speak in tennis metaphors. Shakespeare is the Roger Federer of writers. No, the, um, uh, the, the... I mean, I think Coriolanus is a wonderful example, right? There's one, only one, well, if you don't count all the people offstage who get murdered behind a closed door when Coriolanus uh, invades Coriolis, only one person actually dies in that play. It has an incredibly low body count. And the reason why it has a low body count is because uh, the political process and persuasive rhetoric get in the way of its tragic mechanism. And so the tragic mechanism breaks down, right? Um, which I think is a really fascinating, I think the, the final things that Shakespeare did in each genre are really interesting, like that measure for measure is probably his final, or measure for measure and, and maybe uh, all's well are the final comedies and you can kind of feel him lose faith in the comedy as he writes that play. And uh, uh, in Coriolanus, to have the final tragedy sort of be actually that um, a much greater, uh, more widespread and horrible act of violence is prevented. Um, it's a really, really, really fascinating thing. I'm curious because I agree with you that, that, that war, you know, politics and war, if politics is war by other means, right, um, provide Shakespeare with a wonderful high stakes way to reveal character and have character transform through the, through the crucible of, again, dramatic action. Um, I'm not sure how well they turn out in that, in that test. I mean, if you think about it, to take, I mean, Macbeth for an example, for an example. Um, you know, beyond the fact that he actually seems oddly not particularly bright throughout the play, he's a very weird protagonist. Um, you know, uh, everything goes horribly awry for him and his wife once they commit murder. The other weird thing is that, in, in part because I think Shakespeare bought into, maybe I'm wrong about this, but at least somewhat bought into the kind of uh, cyclical idea of history of his time. Yeah, Macbeth both begins and ends with a rebellious thing of Cawdor being beheaded and some titles being handed out by the king. Like, there's a way in which nothing's changed by the end of that play, despite all the people who get killed. There's just another guy on the throne. It's sort of like, did anyone here see the movie The Death of Stalin? Has anyone seen that movie? Yes. Okay, so at the end of The Death of Stalin, when uh, 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 there's a new ruler in place, and the camera pans up and it just shows you the next guy who's gonna come and take that person's place, and the next guy's, you know, this idea that like, 
all that happens is your next, you know, for example. Or there, I think there's one of the fascinating things about Julius Caesar within the play Julius Caesar is he's sort of like, there's a, there's a, he's kind of a gullible schmo in that play in a lot of different ways. Um, and because I think there was something that I admire as, a, as an artist about Shakespeare, that there's a perversity to him where he really likes taking what you think you might know about the source material or the character, and he's going to front load the exact opposite of it. He, um, so, you know, the first time you see Julius Caesar is this weird Mark Anthony run this race, touch my wife during the race, get her pregnant, I'm going to announce to everyone we can't have kids. You know, that right before he dies, he, he sees that there's the whole scene of the vision. I mean, I just think there's, a, there's an interesting thing there. Um, but I do agree that Henry V is a pretty major counter argument that we could spend the rest of the night talking about. Like, I think you make good points there. I'm just saying that I think there's 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 complexity there that's thorny and difficult to, to nail down. Uh, we touched on this a little bit, but I'd like to reorient the conversation a little bit. I think a, a very interesting political question is Shakespeare's depiction of people who are kind of outside of the process, who are excluded from certain communities or who are strangers to certain communities and whether or not whether or not they can ever be sort of reconciled or integrated or whether or not those things are, are even good. And so, so Shakespeare's depiction of, uh, of Othello or of Aaron the Moor and Titus Andronicus, Shakespeare's depiction of, of Shylock and, and, and the general question of his depiction of Jews in his plays, I think is very interesting. Um, in the histories and in the tragedies, uh, the, the general exclusion of women from the political process is, I think, really interesting. Or often the whole play. Right, or, right, yeah. Um, if, you, if you just read the histories and tragedies, you would have no idea how many fan fantastic female characters Shakespeare wrote in his, in his comedies, but, but they tend to be there. Um, and I'd like to circle back to that later if we can as well. But so I'm just generally interested in all of your understanding of, of Shakespeare's depiction of people who are, who are outside or marginal. Well, I think that's the center of his two Venetian plays, uh, Othello and Merchant of Venice. Now, Shakespeare lived in a world of exclusive communities. Uh, it was, um, Jews had been banished uh, from England uh, under Edward the Confessor. Uh, they had relatively recently been banished from Spain uh, in 1492. So it's not surprising that he should show communities that in some ways define themselves in opposition to other communities. It is very significant, I think, that he was attracted to Venice, because that was the community that uh, accepted Jews, uh, accepted Moors, uh, and what Shakespeare noticed is it did this on the basis of commerce, uh, that Venice wanted to be the great commercial uh, center of the Mediterranean, and it was, uh, and uh, uh, it was making a claim that's familiar to us, that you can have a community among Christians, Muslims, and Jews, and it can work. Uh, in particular, Shakespeare understood what the attraction of strangers were to such a community. Uh, Venice is a community of merchants. They're not very uh, warlike, yet they are faced with the opposition of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, they fought over various islands like Rhodes and Cyprus uh, in the Mediterranean. And so in terms of that play, Venice has to hire its own Turk. That's how they think of Othello, even though he is a Christian, but a Christian convert. Similarly, Venice is a city that needs banking, uh, needs to finance all its commerce. But Christians are forbidden to take interest from other Christians. Uh, and it's pretty hard to run a commercial empire without a money market and interesting things. So Venice admits a Jew, uh, Shylock, and uh, other Jews as well. But, uh, <laughs> And this is something Shakespeare understood about the profound hypocrisy of Venice, uh, that it claims to embrace these people whom they need precisely for the ways in which they are non-Venetian. And it seems to admit them as citizens, but then they turn out to be what we call second-class citizens. It's manifested in the fact that the Venetian merchant Brabantio does not want a fellow marrying his daughter. Uh, Obviously, the conflict between uh, uh, Shylock and Antonio culminates in a moment when a law uh, applying to non-citizens is applied uh, to uh, Shylock. So it's a very interesting, both plays together raise very interesting issues. Uh, in some ways, Venice was the form of the community, uh, but Shakespeare seems to be worried whether any city, even a republic, 
will be honest in its admission of foreigners. Uh, uh, Othello ends in tragedy. Merchant of Venice comes very close to a tragic ending. Only Shylock's apparent willingness to convert to Christianity uh, stops him from being killed. It would be a, a tragedy. Uh, so I think it, it is a problem Shakespeare was very aware of, uh, uh, despite the ban against Jews uh, that probably were something like a thousand Jews in Elizabethan London. Uh, he certainly encountered wars. Uh, it's hard for us to understand how deeply involved England was in the whole Mediterranean trade. They had actually had a treaty with the Ottoman Empire, a trade treaty. Uh, so I think he was observing uh, these degrees of difference. And he, he's, again, you see his genius and his ability to identify what would become a deep problem for centuries. Uh, uh, and, and he doesn't allow it to have a simple resolution. Uh, uh, he really questions whether cities will be true to their claims to admit foreigners, even in the case of Venice. Uh, I, I feel like, for me, like a lot of this comes, uh, I, at least since Lemire has, has ended, I've become very interested in this question as it applies to performance practice um, throughout you know, time. <laughs> um, uh, and so I just want to drop as a little tidbit, you know, like the role to play if you were part of the Yiddish theater was Shylock. And Merchant of Venice was called Shylock. It was retitled Shylock. Jacob Adler, the greatest actor manager in the history of the Yiddish theater, his two major roles were Uriel Acosta, which is for another day, and Shylock, right? Um, the role that Stanislavski always wanted to get right were Shylock and Othello. Um, uh, and he never could. They were his white whales, shall we say, to bring up another text with interesting racial components. Um, so uh, uh, I find it very interesting how our ideas of all these things have changed over time. And I wonder um, what happens now when we tend to think of the performer performing the role on stage as authentic in a way that I'm not sure would have been true in Shakespeare's day when it's a character wearing prosthetics, and essentially a mask, right? Prosthetics and, and, and maybe uh, darkened makeup, for example. Or if they're playing a woman, there everyone knows it's a man and, or a, a, a teenage boy, you know, dressed up as a woman. And so I'm, I'm interested in how the meaning of the play has changed when our expectations of what the performance is. I'm not saying I have a good answer to that question, but that's been a, that, that's sort of what I've been thinking about a lot with these plays. I will say one of the really fascinating things that one of the scholars I spoke to about Othello said uh, is, you know, um, she said, I, I'm very angry, this was, uh, uh, Ayanna Thompson I think said this, you know, she's like, I'm pretty annoyed that we keep coming back to Othello and we don't come back to Titus Andronicus where Aaron actually is better than everyone else. Like Aaron says, you all think I'm better than you are and that's why you're scared of me and actually I am. You know, where he's agentic and he's confident, and even though he does horrible things, you know, like it, she, she would, you know. So I, I do think, I, I don't know, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff there within, um, you know, is there a way to deconstruct these roles in some way now in performance so that we can see them as performances of gender and race and otherness and what could be revealed if we did that? That's sort of where my mind goes. There's a lot of um, I go back to um, John Paul's initial framing of the query, which was about, um, I think he said strangers and outsiders, and then, um, and then as you first um, framed it, it had to do um, with race and religion, and then also with, um, and also with gender, and I think, um, Oh, <laughs> so much to say. Um, I just I just taught a class and I'm writing a paper about um, about Stranger Things <laughs> in Shakespeare oh. and the like the overlap between um, the the legal definition the um, Tudor and Stuart legal definition of a stranger who is um, often a refugee, sometimes a re religious refugee, um, usually there for mercantile purposes. Um, there is a there's a big um, the, um, the play that kind of framed this class and it framed my thinking was one I didn't even teach for the class, and it was Thomas More, um, uh, which is a late, weird, collaborative play, but um, possibly Shakespeare um, wrote a, a, an amazing speech um, for Thomas More um, that, that um, 
it's a scene is a, um, a, a riot of the apprentices in London, and um, many of whom are religious refugees and um, or strangers. And um, Thomas More um, speaks um, in their defense and says, I mean, how many of you, um, essentially, how many of you were all strangers? How, how can you um, think to close our borders? How can you think to close our city? How can you think to do this? Um, you, you would be a nobody case. And um, so, to, I like that articulation that we're all strangers and potential strangers um, and how to um, encounter, I mean, I, 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 you know, when, when Hamlet says, um, when Horatio says, um, you know, this strange thing we have seen, two nights passing or whatever, and, um, and Hamlet says, um, and therefore as a stranger, give it welcome. Like that is, to me, one of the most radically um, wonderful things <laughs> that, um, that we get from um, Shakespeare's um, treatment of strangers or outsiders. That he um, that he has um, he urges us um, to give the strange or the potential outsider welcome. It is not though that he doesn't um, the, that the plays, I should say. Um, also remain attentive to um, the um, the possible disorders that arise both from strangers and outsiders, but also from the the strangers in in the midst of an incorporate body. So um, when um, Tamora says that she has become an incorporate realm. She's no longer a threat. She's no longer the marauding goth. And um, she is um, buried outside the city walls, but at least she's buried. She becomes part of the earth, even if it's not necessarily part of Rome. Whereas Aaron is you know, set a lot to vanish, so he becomes kind of the ultimate outsider. I mean, I, uh, I, I'm just kind of circling around these terms without coming to any answer. I guess, uh, um, again, I come to. Um, we get these various scenes and even lines um, that confront us um, with strangeness and um, I hope ideally um, make us confront our own strangeness and um, then it's up to us um, to, to, to learn how to give these things welcome um, and not, um, not shut down. But, um, I think there's a much more complicated answer that I was going to just take a moment online, but I think you could have a question. Can I, can I ask, Nicole, um, when your students are confronting, say, Othello, for example, right? Or, uh, uh, I'm assuming you, I don't know if you teach Othello, but you know, when, when, when in the classroom, you know, how, how, do, how does, I, I'm very curious about how that plays out. I've never taught Othello, right, because I mostly teach contemporary. Uh, but but uh, I taught it once, but it was in at a school with very quiet students who wouldn't tell me if they had a problem with that. Uh, but uh, but when, if, if you're teaching a fellow, or, I mean, Taming of the Shrew, I think, comes up a lot in these conversations, immersion events or whatever, how, how do the students sort of um, uh, 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 think through how those plays are treating Othello or Shylock? Are they provoked by it? Or are they? I can. Yeah. I don't know, I feel really odd. Yeah, so, yeah, I know. I, 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 I'm like, just curious about like like the classroom experience of it. Um, I have to talk about. I teach um, Titus almost every time, and um, and I've taught Merchant before. But I think um, yes, there is. Um, we're meant to be provoked, right? Although I hate coming back to intention, but um. I think the initial account encounter is often um, hostile. Um, so people, um, and I don't think this is limited to students. Um, most of us, um, if we like, if we had seen a Shylock, you know, in a bright way, the common Shylock, um, you know, this anti-Semitic stereotype. Um, if we saw that now, we would be offended. Um, most of us, if we see um, Aaron, the more, I mean, um, they, um, if we see the picture of Aaron, the more, like, 
outsider. That's um, it's, it's supposed to be traveling. Um, I don't know if that's your question. But no, yeah, but yeah, it, it, it becomes a site of um, resistance because um, it, where then the tendency is sometimes to just say, oh well, again, here's this old dead white dude who uh, doesn't, uh, who can't speak to my like, and, and to to um, the experience of anyone. Um, who is not immediately of that world. And so these um, become almost caricatures and then too easily dismissed. So when, um, I think it's when, as we keep digging, and um, oftentimes and this is where I think think historicism for um, teaching us that we have to look at things like text and context and look at the anti-Semitic literature, you know, look at the, the Pyrrhus' tale, um, um, to, to see where, where these um, seeming caricatures are coming from. And we can also, um, we can also think about how genre works in these, and especially in these two cases. You know, um, the, the Merchant of Venice is, is, is in some ways, a really radical because partly because it's rewriting a revenge tragedy, and um, and Titus is um, a, an early revenge tragedy. So, like, what he's doing within um, within and without genre at this moment has to do with um, how much um, how we treat the characters. So, Aaron in um, Titus is, I think, easier to teach, and again, this is why I start with this, because um, in some ways he's, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a vice figure from a morality play, so we can talk a little bit about theater history, but, um, and so that, that um, but that's also, um, then we get to consider how he is not a vice figure and how he is, um, as um, Professor Thompson points out, um, in some ways um, the most, um, moral person in the play, certainly when it comes to nurturing in this play that is so much about um, diving murdered sons, he's the only good father. So anyway, um, I think I can kind of Something that I touched upon, and now I hope we can, we can come back to, I guess, two versions of the same question. But Shakespeare's depiction of the exclusion of women from the political process, and it immediately comes to mind, uh, Portia's argument to Brutus and, and Julius Caesar that, that she's being left out, and also uh, Lady Percy in the fourth part one, two very, very similar scenes. Uh, that's again in Richard II. Right, so that's right, yeah. again in Richard II. And, um, and another thing is just, is there a way that we can kind of politically think about his comedies? I think we, we've been tending to focus on the histories and the tragedies, and is there a way of understanding the comedies? That's part of well, I'm going to question, question your whole premise here. Oh, good. Uh, uh, <laughs> You know, uh, first of all, there's the simple fact that uh, all female roles were played by boys, uh, and uh, it's not that easy to find a Leonardo DiCaprio uh, who could have easily played women at that comparable stage. And so one reason there are fewer women in the plays is simply theatrical. But after all, uh, Shakespeare knew of someone named Queen Elizabeth. Uh, this country was being ruled by a woman. Uh, and he created, if you had the top 10 female characters in world drama, about five of them are written by Shakespeare. And I'm talking about Lady Macbeth, I'm talking about Cleopatra, I'm talking about Portia and so on. So in fact, and, and do remember a rather limited number of women in history to that point and rural countries. So in that sense, he was reflecting uh, a reality and it does seem wherever he could, he could introduce a uh, powerful figure, above all Cleopatra, one of the greatest portraits of a ruler uh, ever. Uh, even the fact that Portia raises the issue shows that Shakespeare is aware of it, and he presents her um, as a noble figure uh, for doing so. Uh, but I will bring up the comedies now, because it's, uh, 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 some of the greatest characters in Shakespeare are the most complex are the heroines of his comedies. And I'm thinking of Rosalind uh, in As You Like It. Uh, uh, I, I once read someone who said, uh, uh, where men rule the world in Shakespeare, it's tragedy. Where women rule the world, it's comedy. And there's a real truth to that. Because men in Shakespeare, Shakespeare's tragedy, represent uh, an unbending, unyielding attitude towards the world, my way or the highway. 
uh, what Shakespeare shows about women is they can compromise. And that's not a bad thing in politics. I don't think that is going to be Well, <laughs> wait, wait, uh, no, uh, okay, and she breaks under the strain. But I'm talking about the comedies here. Uh, and what we said, Portia's the figure who brings about the comic resolution in the Virgin of Venice. Uh, and certainly in As You Like It, uh, and in so many of the comedies, is the women that figure out the way out of the dilemma, impartially because they have the comic reconciling spirit. Well, I do believe we have to take into account the entire world of Shakespeare's plays. And there you see uh, women are not limited in their role. And in fact, we have to marvel at these young boys who were able to play uh, such comp complex figures in Shakespeare's first half of his career, he managed to get the women dress up as young boys, as happens with Portia and Rosalind. That made it easier for the illusion uh, to prevail. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, the, the person who wrote the article in the Atlantic that Shakespeare must have been a woman. Uh, I forget her name now. But, but her argument was he understands women so well, he must have been a woman. Uh, and I'm, I don't know if that argument uh, works, but I do think that uh, he shows uh, a great interest in women and a great interest in their psychology and creates some very complex characters. Uh, unprecedented to that point in world drama, and I don't think you see women of comparable complexity until the late 19th century in Ibsen um, and so on. Uh, so I, uh, many things you can criticize Shakespeare on, but uh, not his inability to portray women or to show their significance in life. And above all, in the comedies, they represent a really healthy side of life that makes things go forward. It's the men that end up in these impasses. Shylock and Antonio uh, in uh, Merchant of Venice. Uh, it's the men who are too dumb to see that there's a way out. And I particularly am impressed with the, the sheer intelligence of characters like Portia and, and Roswell. Uh, oh, oh, I saw what you were doing. Just the memory, you know. <laughs> you know uh, uh, I, I mean, I do think you and I have talked about this in the past, John Holden, that there is something where Shakespeare is very interested in male inadequacy. I think that's actually true in, in whichever genre he's in. Um, uh, and um, in the comedies, it's the clearest. But there, you know, you, you, you often, I mean, Rosalind has to train Orlando to be worthy of her, right? That's part of what the dramatic action, of, as you like it, is, is Rosalind sort of, in disguise, tutoring this, this you know, lovable, Dollars to be to be to be to be worthy of her love, um, which is a really fascinating thing. Um, uh, it's probably the most fascinating thing about those middle acts, where they're actually like sometimes just feels like people are on stage talking to trees at great length. Um, uh, but um, uh, and I do think that you know in the comedies there is a way that women find agency within them that operates differently. Um, a writing mentor of mine once said this thing about, um, who was in writing fiction. He said, um, a problem for your text has to become a problem in your text, which is that the characters have to be aware of what this problem is. And I think there's, you can make the case that in that scene that keeps recurring in Richard II, Henry IV, Part I, etc., that those scenes are a way of doing that. The, the women are often say like, why aren't you just confiding in me what's going on? Why are you a stranger in my bed? Why do you want to make love to your horse? You know, person. Um, uh, you know, let's let's talk about this. And the, and the men are refusing to, and often pay a very steep price. Um, particularly, Julius Caesar pays a very steep price for not listening to his wife on the day that he dies. Um, uh, and in the comedies, there are ways in which greater. I mean, not all of them, obviously, but in which, in which, uh, in which other kinds of agency can be found. But often it requires fleeing the city, right? Often upending that order requires fleeing the society with its institutional arrangements that we are familiar with and going to some other wonderland where the rules can be upended and shifted. And that's part of what's delightful. Thanks, Thanks. Um, I think I'm going to start with the first 
Helen Mirren to play the part. <laughs> Helen, Helen Mirren is, yeah. Helen Mirren is 